My name is Lindsay Nywa. On May 29th, our family lost a son, husband, and my brother Brandon, also affectionately known as Beach. Tonight, we are so pleased to introduce Bob Wilkie and his team at I Got Mind. Through my conversations with Bob, I can tell you I've been extremely impressed and touched by his intentions, integrity, and his commitment to helping others. I hope you enjoy tonight's event. Hi, everybody. Uh, Bob Wilkie here with you. Happy to be here um, for the second part where we're going to be talking about loss and grief. And, you know, tonight's um, a pretty powerful one. And uh, I think about all the different loss that I've experienced in my life. And, and you know, last week, I've got my two good friends here with me, uh, Kate Waters and Sean O'Grady from, from last week as well. And, Sean, when we, when we talked last week about trauma, and I'm thinking all week about loss and grief in this presentation, um, so much of it, the loss and the grief especially, um, was because of that experience, right? That, that traumatic experience of, of that loss of that thing in my life and, and then caused all these crazy emotions. We're going to talk a lot tonight, but trauma is kind of caused by or can be caused by loss that we incur. Yeah, just a, a deep interconnection, very much woven together. Um, you know, you, you know, I would imagine for people that were with us last week as well, that there'll be some parallel experiences from some of the core concepts that we discussed and how they will show up, maybe sound different, maybe resonate a little bit different, but there's a deep connectedness to um, trauma being a sense, uh, the response to, to, you know, grief and loss situations. I think one of the things that's most important to know is that we do better when things are predictable. And, uh, and that's how we become a little bit more resilient when we manage stress, uh, grief and or loss of something is somewhat unpredictable. And that's where uh, we develop more, more vulnerability or, or more sensitization to that stress. Yeah. There, there's a quote on the screen there that we used to, to open up and it's, you know, grief is in two parts. And, and I think everybody understands this part. The first part is loss. The second part is that remaking of the life. And Kate, when we talk about, uh, you know, going through the grieving process, it, it really is about being able to remake uh, life in a different way because of the loss that we've incurred. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, we talk about grief and sometimes we talk about that trauma being something different, but both are our response to that experience, right? And, that, and that's what can make the difference in terms of how we move forward or fail to move forward, which is okay as well if we don't know how to do that. And so again, that's why we're here um, to talk about these important things that everybody experiences in some degree, um, but do, we don't always know how to build ourselves back up and remake that life because it's going to look different. And sometimes that's scary. Yeah. It, it's terrifying, actually. Um, and tonight we're going to share some great stories. I've got uh, Willie Desjardin was kind enough to join us. So you're going to listen to a little bit of Willie, my great friend, Darren Kruger, my old D partner uh, from back in junior days and, and you know, a hat resident, uh, was a coach there for a long time. And then another friend of mine, Chris Joseph, uh, Chris and I grew up playing against each other and, and played on some of the same teams. And, and there was a tragedy that he went through um, and some loss that we're going to experience and just talk about the whole gamut, you know, what loss is, what grief is, and well, how do we get moving forward? We're going to use something tonight that uh, we didn't use last week and just wanted to ask some questions and get you guys involved a little bit. So on the screen, you're going to see um, slido.com. So if you have your phone in front of you, if you have to open another web browser, um, you can go ahead and do that. But you're just going to go to slido.com. When you get there, it's going to ask you for a code. The code is just loss. So it's pretty simple um, to log into. Sean, when we do this with our live events, it really helps um, stimulate some thought for the people, but it also really helps us understand what maybe people are experiencing too. I mean, feedback and that feedback loop is so critical to make sure and, and, and maybe to make an adjustment, right? Is just, uh, if, if we're hearing something or seeing a pattern that maybe uh, we, we want to slightly tweak how we're going to respond based on so like that kind of feedback or feedback loop is, I, I think, really, really critical. You know, what's great about Slido, Bob, is this idea that um, 
people can experience the connectedness of not being alone tonight, but not being too vulnerable by feeling like, you know, they, they, they can still share their experience in, in a way of anonymity. Um, but then I think have the benefit of knowing that we're, we're sort of all, all feeling and experiencing things in some sort of a reasonably consistent way. And I think to get everybody to participate, Kate, that nice new hoodie that you're wearing from I Got Mine, maybe we'll give that out because we've got a, a quiz here right at the beginning. And it's a really tough question. And so whoever answers it first, we'll have a winner at the end. Um, we'll coordinate with you to send you one of our I Got Mine hoodies. So go ahead and register if you have it. We'll give it just a little bit more. I wonder if anybody else on Rogers maybe having a tough time getting in on their phone. <laughs> Speaking of, yeah. Lost today. I lost a lot of cell phone coverage, right. <laughs> which uh, then when it kicked back in, it really led to a flurry of activity. Yeah. Okay, we got 25, we got 28, good. 29. Once we start, we can't stop. So we need everybody to register. That's good. I see some of our teammates on there. So if they win, they're not getting a hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's Sherry. All right, 36, 37. Let's get it to 40. Really looking forward to the conversation tonight. You know, I think it's going to be good. I think you guys are really going to enjoy the videos, especially Willie had some great stuff. You know, um, Willie's always been a lot of fun to work with and always insightful and thoughtful. And I'm really looking forward to sharing some of what he went through today. Good. All right, Sadie, start us off. Here comes the question, everybody. Get ready. You got 15 seconds to make the correct, correct answer. What was Garfield's favorite food? Pizza? Tuna? Odie or lasagna? No one participated. Whoa, what happened? There. We went too far. Now it's just a matter of who's got the fastest fingers. <laughs> I always thought it was Odie. Didn't he? Didn't he always? No. no I think he's no? a big old lasagna fan. <laughs> Tuna pizza, lasagna. There. Who was the winner? <laughs> we'll check that when we get to the end. Go ahead and bring up that next slide. Will you say? <laughs> this is such a great quote by Les Brown. Um, when are we prepared for it? Like when I think about my first experience of my, my first loss, right? Was my cat, Spooky. Loved this cat. The cat was the coolest cat. He used to jump up across the rooftops. You know, he'd cuddle with us. He would bring home rabbits. And I walked out after school one day and there's Spooky laying in the front of the house, got hit by a car. Devastated, absolutely crushed. 10 years old, right? Parents try and console, you know, all those different things. As I go through, I think the next really big loss that I incurred was my grandpa. My, I was 14 years old and my grandpa passed away. And it was a sad day, but it wasn't like I wasn't that connected with grandpa. You know, it was sad that grandpa was dead, but, you know, it wasn't the, the devastation of because I love that cat. I love my grandpa, but I love that cat. I spent every day with that cat. He was home with me after school. And all the other loss that incurs after that, we really aren't taught anything about loss. I don't remember anything in elementary, junior high, high school that, you know, it wasn't in home economics. It wasn't in social studies. Nobody ever talked about loss. And that really, I think, caused a lot of confusion because even then, and, and you guys can chime in whenever you want, parents didn't really explain a lot other than spookies in heaven now. You know, like that was about, that was about it. There was no, well, it's going to take a little while to get over it. There was no, this is why it hurts so much. You know, there was no explanation around that loss. And I mean, doesn't that add to it when we're growing up and, and don't those experiences, can't they make us a little bit, maybe a little more skittish to love something like that? It certainly does when, when people don't talk about it or acknowledge it because then inevitably there are a bunch of feelings that bubble up to the surface and 
And then if, if no one's maybe trying to normalize the things like shock and anger and, and confusion, if no one's ever normalizing that or, or helping you understand that, um, it, it's, it's that same old thing where, you know, like we're trying to do with the mental health conversation, which is, man, I must, I must be messed up. I must be jammed up because I'm going through this, but clearly everyone else must be fine. And so this is a me issue. And so we start to, to I think, personalize that there's some character default I must have based on my inability to cope um, because the conversations just aren't occurring. Yeah. Yeah. Kate, as a parent, two little ones, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you think about, and we try and protect them from all the different things that can happen, but we know, we know that they're going to experience somewhere along the way. Uh, how can we be better as parents to make sure that we're maybe educating them a little bit more so that it makes more sense than, than maybe what it did for a lot of our you know, attendees tonight? Yeah, and I think it's it's such an important point and one that gets brought up a lot in some of the work that I do with kids as well as my own kids and some of the things that they've gone through to recognize that one, I need to know what that looks like for me so that I can be supportive of that process for my kids um, when they're going through that and recognize that as we're going to talk about as we go through tonight, it looks different for everybody. And even though the loss may be situationally the same, the experience of that loss is could look a lot different and for kids i typically find that they will hear potentially hear the information but not cognitively process that information until another date and it's and also if we start to teach them at a young age that it's something we don't want to talk about or we don't mention those things then when you think about those neural connections that are being strengthened we're now saying oh oh we need to avoid that that you know that kind of thing when the guys have just said this is part of our life and if we can and we can take control of those pieces of how we're able to move forward then we can do a better job of explaining that to our kids we're going to pull up another slido question for you and it's just and you can check as many boxes as you'd like you know there's a lot of different things that we experience over the course of our lifetime and go ahead and and, and just fill it in because you know one of the things that I, I think we tend to do very much like trauma is that when we go through something, we feel like we're the only one that's in pain. And, and I know you're gonna hear some stories today, you know, that family unit, especially when, when there's a loss, um, it, it causes a whole bunch of crazy things to happen for people, right? We, we, we tend to lose our, well, as, as the quote goes, you lose your mind. And, and then some people aren't affected at all, right? Or don't appear to be. And then I'm angry at that person because you know what, why are they not upset like I am? You know, there's all these different things that happen. And when you look on the screen, right, everybody's have uh, has had some sort of uh, loss and, you know, the loved one is it, it happens. Right. We, we everything ends, Sean. Yeah, I, I think those, you know, some important points to to reflect on and, and resonate on. The, the other piece to that, too, that I, th I think is really important to highlight is um, when we talk about it for family members, um, for kids, sometimes the grief is around watching adults not cope very well with, with a situation and adults are supposed to cope well with all situations, right? And so I think when a loss is somewhat unpredictable and it creates some vulnerability that maybe the person didn't expect, right? Like I lost a loved one in the family um, and we've shown up you know, a certain way, all of a sudden we might be now way more vulnerable ourselves. And I think that's really triggering for our kids or for others that are like, this must really be a big deal because they're always in control. And now, and now they're, they're showing a lot of these emotions. And so it can really spin, right? I think yeah. it can, it can have a cascading effect on a family system. Go ahead, Kate. Yeah. I think just as Sean's talking there, another thing about some of the different experiences that we go through is that kids are very in the moment people. Um, cognitively, they are not generally depending on their age, able to think <clears throat> futuristically. And so if you may talk about the loss of someone in that moment, the impact may not seem that great for that child. As an adult, cognitively, we're able to imagine the loss of, you know, if I, I've lost a parent, this is an example of before I get married, that they won't be there for that, but they won't be there for those. So as an adult, I can imagine all of those things that that person will no longer be around for, whereas a child doesn't do that. And that's, again, that piece where all of a sudden 
well, where's grampy? Where, where is that person? Right. They, they know that they're gone, but they don't know what that means. And that can be really hard as a parent um, to walk them through that journey, especially if you're not ready for that yet. Yeah. And, and a lot of us haven't been taught that, right. As we're going through life and we experience loss, nobody taught me kind of what it was and that there was going to be this grieving process and that I could be angry or that I could be, you know, extremely sad and experience depression. Nobody told me any of this stuff was going to happen. And so you find yourself in the middle of it and you're confused as hell and you don't know where to go. There's some definitions. I love the definitions and we're going to uh, share some of them tonight. There was one particular, this was the first one that came up when I, when I looked for the definition of loss and it's destruction or ruin. And yeah, uh, my experience with the bus, right? There, there was another time where my wife and I were expecting a baby and it was right before Christmas time. And we knew that there were some complications, but everything appeared to be healthy. And we went to the hospital that night because she felt like she was going into labor. And when we get to the hospital, you know, we're all excited and we haven't named it. And we don't know what it is. Right. We're just we're and the doctor comes in and he says, um, it didn't make it. Baby didn't make it. And so that destruction and that ruin, this next video um, is from Chris Joseph and, and his experience of loss, again, talking about destruction and ruin. Well, um, OK, so. April 6, 2018, uh, my son was playing for the Humboldt Broncos. Uh, they were on their way to uh, game five versus Nippon. They were down three games to one. Um, it was uh, a cold day or whatever, and they were on their, they were almost about 15 minutes outside of Nippon when a, uh, a semi truck ran a stop sign at a rural Saskatchewan highway intersection. Um, and the bus hit the semi head on as it went through the stop sign through the intersection. The bus had no place to go. And uh, as a result, the, they both hit about 100 kilometers an hour. As a result, 16 of the boys died. Uh, and my son Jackson was one of the ones that passed away on scene. Um, so we got the call that night. We were ready to watch it on the computer. So yeah, I got a phone call from a friend uh, about 5.45, 6 o'clock. And is a local friend told me there's he's heard there's been a, an accident with the bus. So I called Jackson right away and uh, no answer. Called him again, no answer. I mean, I called four times. And then I called my buddy back. He called me and I said, what do you know? And he's like, well, I only know that there's been an accident. I don't have anything more than that. We we sat around the house for maybe, I don't know, it seemed like an hour. I told my daughter, we don't know what's going on. I told my son. Um, and uh, at about an hour later, my wife basically looked at me and said, what are we still doing here? And I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. And we basically just jumped in the car and drove to Saskatchewan. And then uh, that ride uh, was, well, brutal. It was, uh, I'm usually the calm one in the family. I'm usually the rock. And I hyperventilated from Edmonton to Lloydminster for two and a half hours. And I've never really hyperventilated before. Uh, my history as a firefighter, um, you know, I, I kind of got an idea of, you know, once you start hearing things, I start putting more and more pieces together and I'm, I'm thinking this is not good. And uh, we start hearing about fatalities as we're driving. I'm calling hospitals in Saskatoon, Regina, Edmonton. I'm, I'm trying to phone Stars Air Ambulance. I'm not getting anything. I'm calling um, uh, coaches, uh, the ones that have the numbers for billets. Uh, I didn't know a lot of the parents, um, but as we drove further and further, it became more bleak. Um, so that was kind of, I mean, there's a lot more to it, but that was kind of our April 6th night um, and uh, took us till about 
three in the morning, two, three in the morning until we could, uh, until we understood that Jackson was one that didn't make it. Now, when we talk about laws, Sean, you know, it's, um, it's that destruction or ruin. There's those incidents in our lives where the loss is catastrophic, right? That's what you would hear on the news. And, and, and it causes somebody like Chris, who, like you said, I'm the rock of the family. Um, you know, they always depend on me, but this incident, you know, takes me out of being in that role, which, which can really cause more loss for other people because that stability that they had, that person that they had to lean on during those times, all of a sudden that's gone too. So, you know, it's important to understand that as we're experiencing these different forms, different types of loss, just a whole gamut of things can be going on. And, and in a very, you know, in those early hours um, of, of just a, I mean, it just um, connected with Chris with you a couple of times, but it, that never makes that story any easier because you as a parent, you can just put your, you know, try to, and I really can't, um, but it's, but it's very, very painful to hear him, hear him describe that that idea of the, the arousal continuum and how we move up and down in our brains. And so for a situation like that, people that would have just been in that sort of absolute, um, you know, terror, right? Like that, that sort of highly, um, uh, highly emotional, autonomic, frozen part of our brain where really it's just, it's just sheer terror. And, and so the, the way the body responds to that, you know, in those minutes and hours would be the hard to regulate our, our heart rate, hard to regulate our blood pressure heart, because we're in, we're, we're in this sort of prolonged state of fear and terror. Um, and, and uh, just you, what you would want to try to do for yourself or for other people in that situation is very different than what you're going to want to do three months later and six months mm -hmm. later and 11 months. So I think it's, it's knowing the state as well that somebody's in and, and trying to just appreciate um, you certainly wouldn't want to be trying to offer a lot of cognitive information at a time like that. It's just sort of being present, right. With, with, with people in a, in a situation like that. And, and there's some people that absolutely have that ability to be you know what I mean? To recognize for what it is and stay in that, like we'd say, wizard part of your brain, even though it's happened to them, it, it's different for everybody as we kind of go through it. Um, but identifying, you know, when you're in lizard brain like that, when you've gone through something like that, I can tell you when we went through what we did at the hospital, there was no opportunity for me to even try and regulate, mm -hmm. you know, as much as I wanted to console her, the devastation that I was experiencing kind of rendered me helpless. Yeah. And, and so, you know, it was a really tough situation for us to be in. The, the other form of loss, um, another definition there, it just says the state of being deprived of something or being without what someone has had. And, and Kate, you know, when you think about that, it could be fluffy, right? It, it, it could be gam gam, right? Those things that were normally here, um, but all of a sudden they're not there anymore, right? And, and it's important that we understand that this is another form of loss, that it's not that devastation, it's not that ruin, but it is the thing that we were used to being there is all of a sudden not there anymore. Absolutely. And I think that that's where we want to come back to making sure that we're not comparing what that loss looks like, right? Is that, again, we talked a lot about last week in terms of that comparison, that judgment that we can sometimes find ourselves in. And, and we want you to remember that about your loss, that um, recognizing who that person or that individual or that pet was to you. And now it's moving forward without that piece. You know, people will sometimes diminish the loss of a pet at times. And when you think about um, the regulation and the relationship and that social connection, even though reciprocally, cognitively, they can't speak to me, um, unconditional love is a really important point that pets can offer to people that is incredibly difficult to replace when that loss happens. Um, and so to say that, oh, well, it, it's just a, an animal is not fair to that person. And again, we really want to make sure that we're staying out of a judgment place, regardless of what the loss looks like because it's such an individual experience and it, it's why we're trying to paint this picture because you know you got the, the the devastation and destruction yes and now you've got that we're deprived of the thing that we were very used to and it was a part of our lives um krug's uh is going to talk a little bit about what he went through and his family um in in the accident that we incurred back in 96. 
86. I was in North Alver playing for the Junior North Stars there. And my girlfriend was down at the time. And then um, it was after the game. We were at home. And my brother Trev had called me and said, you better come home. Um, and then just heard about the accident. So obviously right there was sheer panic. Um, kind of knowing kind of what happened and tried to get the whole story behind of what happened and who was involved. Um, so me and my girlfriend, we, we made a, uh, a bet to, to drive home that night, which probably wasn't the greatest idea because it was storming out and we slid off the road going home and it was just a crazy night. And um, I was just kind of a blank stage all night. And I remember getting home, um, walking through the door and I just ran into a bedroom and just started crying like for, for, for a half hour and, you know, and just realizing the impact that it just hit me as I walked through the door and then seeing my family there. And so it, it was, it, it was tough. And so, you know, as I guess as the days moved on, it was, um, you know, you always had visitors coming by just to see how everybody was doing. And it always sparked up a, another morning session. And, 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 you know, that went on for a few days. And so, um, you know, I think it was important for me to be with my friends. Uh, I took some time off, obviously, you know, Kelly McCrimmon, head coach at the time, said just take as much time as you needed. So, um, you know, yeah, I think it was important for me to be around the family and, and, and to be around my friends um, just to soak everything of kind of just what happened. So, um, you know, from there, and I guess I, I really wasn't ready to go back. And I just wanted to make sure because mom had hit the most, obviously. Um, wanted to make sure that she was at peace with it for as much as you can at the time and um, before I headed back. And so I was able to do that a couple weeks later and, and head back. And, um, you know, from there on in, it was, it was just kind of a, a dreary year. Um, you know, I was, I was able to, to, to put it on the back burner of some sort and continue playing and, um, and finish the year off. So. Again, not not an easy story, but you know, in in knowing Krugs as well as I do, and and you know how he missed him. Like they they weren't together every day growing up, yes, but then they all had their journeys, and then all of a sudden knowing that that you know summertime or that experience wasn't going to be there, he couldn't pick up the phone, you know what I mean, and do some of the things. Uh, another form of loss that was defined in the dictionary is failure to make good use of something as time. How many times do we regret? You know, as we're experiencing loss, do we regret that we didn't do this more, that we regret that we didn't go over and visit more, that we didn't, right, in, in the job, that we didn't work hard enough or that we didn't dig in, you know, all, all those different things that, again, can, it, it doesn't make it any easier, but all these different experiences, you know, people can associate loss with just one devastating, destructive thing, but you know, the definition really brought up all these different points that I think it's important we talk about. And Kate, like you said, they're all unique, right? This one here, this failure to make good use of something. And when I look back at the lost opportunities in my career, because I didn't know because I was traumatized and I was suffering and I was doing all those things, that, that's a huge loss in my life that, that carries a lot of regrets with it. And so it's important, you guys, and feel free to jump in, but you know, when, when we go through these different things, really important when we kind of have that moment is, is to maybe think about what, what we are experiencing in that moment. And if we don't or can't see something hopeful in the future, it makes that loss of what the past was even that much more painful and overwhelming. And I think that's, that's really when people talk about present moment awareness, uh, you know, as difficult as it is, it, it really is all we have is the now, right? The here and now and how much, how much of our time is spent focusing on the past or the future, neither of which I have any control over. And the only thing I have control over, we often let pass by in significant amounts of time spending in past and future. And, and there's, there's absolutely elements of that that's just a necessary part of the grieving process. But, but I think, again, um, you know, when you've had the opportunity to talk to people where it's a little bit more predictable, so some end of life, some end of life conversations uh, with people where there's a bit more of a planful, um, expected, you know, sort of end to them, you know, you think of a terminal illness, 
you know, I read a couple of those books. Tuesdays with Maury was a really good book about that. And, and you know, a couple other articles where people go, you know, you, when they really encourage you to think about things, it's like, I've never met someone at the end of their life that says, I wish I cleaned my house more. Or, you know, I wish I worried more about, you know, that promotion I was going to get. Like they, people that, you know, they, they go, I, I wish I would have spent more of these connected relational experiences, right? And, and I think, sadly, when we don't get into those um, relational based experiences, we spend a lot of time worrying about the things that, you know, if it was, if, if it was all over soon, I'm not sure we would worry so much about it. You know, yeah, all good points. And, and when we go through these experiences, it really is, you know, they're different phases, they're different feelings, they're different, all this stuff, because the loss is different. It's not one unique thing. It, it causes all sorts of different things. Kate, when we, when we're talking about our brains and, and, and what goes on, it's so important that we understand as we're experiencing this loss, what happens to us? And, and then how the hell do we get out of feeling like that? And I think Sean alluded to that a little bit earlier, right? Is that um, when we are experiencing that immense loss or the unknown of potential loss, our brain shifts into that wizard protection mode. We are in a different state of functioning and our our system does not know why that's happening. It just knows that it's happening. And so our on and on response is to protect ourselves, is to, I am in danger, I am in fear, and I need to protect myself at all cost. Um, and that's why when we look at some of the cognitive strategies that we try to use in different moments where I can maybe talk myself out of it, um, that would be coming in at the wizard brain, but I'm actually functioning in the lizard brain. So again, making sure that those developmental interventions are appropriate based on your state. And Sean alluded to that when he said, you need to know your state of functioning and what that looks like. And, you know, right now, I think it is really important to recognize uh, what COVID has done for an entire world and the loss that everybody in some capacity has accumulated in different ways. And I feel like the recognition of that is so important because I everybody's just a little bit more on edge. We talk about it being the COVID cloud or that extra weight on top. So when you think about your functioning, just think about the fact that you are not as far away from that lizard brain as maybe you were prior to COVID when we weren't experiencing the state of the world that we're in right now and potentially all the loss that we have incurred during that time. There's, um, you hit a wall right? You've, you've experienced the loss and, and it could be destructive. It could be that you realize you're never going to see that person or that, you know, pet again. Um, you're never going to have that opportunity again. And Chris does a really good job here on this video, just talking about uh, why I think he verbalizes what happens when we hit the wall. <sighs> well, First of all, I did. I didn't drive today, Mister. My, my uh, I basically told her I can't drive, and I was trying to be strong. Um, when we first got the news, there's that. I don't know if it's. I mean, all the all the feelings, all the emotions hit you from every angle all at once. You're 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 already doing the twelve step program. You're doing the bargaining, the the acceptance. You're you're doing them all at once. Um, you know, once you, once we knew that Jackson was gone, uh, we we still held the hope. Uh, those, let's say, uh, from five p.m. to about noon the next day. So those twelve to sixteen hours, not knowing for sure, those were the worst. Those those were brutal. So those were like. You know, you hope and you pray that somebody made a mistake somewhere. There's there's a got to be a mistake. Jackson's one of the boys that's alive. And then um, when we went to the morgue and, and we saw him, um, and it was without any question at all that that was our son, um, you know, that's when all the other ones hit you. And you're like, yeah, this is real. And... You just, 
I don't know, you just want to hold them and uh, try to try to keep the rest of the group together. There's a realization that our family is never the same. And in, and in so you kind of realize that you're never the same. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you which emotion hits you first. Um, it felt like they all hit me at the same time. And then later on, as things slowed down a little bit, then I would feel more times when I'm just angry, more times when I'm just sad, more times when I'm uh, just in denial. And I, I recognized a lot of those, like I was in denial. I'm like, there are times when, like we're two years later now, there's times when I'm like, I'm just going to walk through the front door. And it's like, I'm just kidding, dad. And I know that that's not going to happen. I'm not delusional, but there's a just the little little thing that says, wouldn't that just be really nice? Yeah. Right? Other members of my family have gone the opposite. Like I, I like to be distracted. I like to be busy. I like to not have it in my face all the time. Because if I'm if it's quiet, then I get sad. Um, other members of my family have said basically, what's the point of freaking trying? You know, we're just gonna die. Um, you know, I got no motivation, not me, but I'm just saying other, other yeah. members of the family have no motivation to eat right, exercise, uh, do any of the stuff that we used to like to do. So just the four members in our family alone are doing different things all the time. And, you know, we're just trying to support each other. Yeah. Sean, he brings up some really good points there. And when we talk about, you know, grief, the definition of grief, Sadie, if you don't mind pulling that up, because I think, you know, it, it, it goes hand in hand with probably why a lot of the people are on the call today is because they're experiencing some form of that or need to learn because somebody else is experiencing some form of that, you know, mental suffering or distress over affliction, sorrow or regret, right? So again, it's pretty wide blanket that we're throwing out here. And the thing that really resonated with Chris, when, when he was talking there was, you are never going to be the same, right? No matter what it is, whether it's that pet or whether it's that job or whether it's a, a loved one, your life is never going to be the same. And I think at that point, it, it kicks in at some point during the grieving process when you realize, right? When you wake up tomorrow and, and everything that you are used to is no longer there. And, and what happens to our brains? Why does why do we act like that, Sean? Um, and why is it so hard to get out of? Because I think we're always striving to return to some place of equilibrium or balance, right? And, and when we're out of balance, there's a real uneasiness or this kind of unanchoredness. I thought Chris does an amazing job of, of validate and highlight that it's a whole cascading or just a, a number of multiple feelings and experiences. And it's why, you know, there's been a lot of good work done with, with grief and lost work and there's theories and there's models and they're really just guideposts. I think it's so, even when we were asked to come and do this, this conversation, the one thing I wanted to do is to make sure that I'm not coming with some tidy little model that's going to be condescending and shitty for people that go that actually makes absolutely no sense. And how dare you think that you're going to package my pain and suffering up into some little step by step, you know, and again, that that's what's so important when we talk to, uh, you know, Melba, who lost her daughter in Sandy Hook, right, she, she said the most unhelpful thing was the um, the arrogance of well-intended clinical people that showed up and said, this is what you're dealing with and here is how we're going to, like gave, you know, because they already didn't get choice over the suffering that they are now, you know, just like Chris and so many of those other families. And so what we can at least get a bit of choice over is how I'm going to start walking forward. And, and I, that's where I think we have to really be careful to just walk alongside people without being overly directive about what you should or yeah. shouldn't do, uh, given that it, people are in different stages or, or different spots in their own, you know, way of, of re 
you know, managing the situation. And I think the stages would have been important for me to know in all those different losses and then those grieving periods, because I didn't know, right. Yeah. This was pre-internet stuff. So we, you couldn't just Google, you know what I mean? Yeah. What are the stages? And, and Kate, when you look at those on the screen there, you know, we've got denial, angle, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. That's just a roller coaster of emotion. And unfortunately, this can go on for a long period of time for individuals. Definitely, Bob. And I think, like Sean said, it's really important to recognize that this is just there to help you understand potentially what you might be going through. We talked a lot last week about, um, you know, knowledge is power. And this is another place where if you feel like you can start labeling what some of those emotions are or start understanding the feelings you're having, you may feel a little bit more in control and, and know how to move forward from that. Or you may not. It just may be that you, you have somewhere to define what that looks like for you. Um, you know, I think, again, we talk about about grief and loss being such an individual experience, um, the developer of this, this model states that we, we are moving in and out of these constantly. Um, we may move past some and then go backwards depending on some of the experiences that we have. Um, and that it, it's such an individual experience. But again, this is here to potentially provide you with some information about yourself. But we really want to reinforce that if you are not walking through these stages chronologically in order, that you, there is nothing wrong with you. Um, this is just, like Sean said, that, that guidepost that we can sometimes refer to to help that process being moved forward. Yeah. I, I think about some of those different losses and, and you have that day where you accept it. Right. It's like, oh, my God, this is this is where we're at. And then you wake up the next day and you're just furious and you just want to smash the shit out of everything. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and I think it is important that we do that. Willie Desjardins, um, yeah, he's just uh, he really put some things in perspective. Sadie, if you don't mind pulling that up, um, he talks about, you know, we experience one loss and, and how those losses can create some pretty negative momentum. Ken, and the hard thing about losing <clears throat> is losing creates a bit of momentum on its own. And what occurs with that is you go, okay, you're losing, and then you, you're going to change it around. You're going to change. But the problem is losing gains momentum. And even when you change, lots of times you don't get immediate results. And that's what loses people. They change, they make the decision, but then they keep losing. And so then, they, then they're right back to where they started, but they tried. And now it's even harder to try again. <clears throat> the thing with losing streaks is you have to do the right thing for more than just one or two days. It has to be a week. Like you have to be able to stay with it. And hope is, hope is such a huge thing. Like you need hope. If you don't have hope, it's really hard to invest a lot. So somewhere you got to have the hope that if I do these things, this losing streak will end and I will become better. And lots of times with young people, they don't, they don't have mentors. They don't have people that are there to tell them it's okay. You will come out of it. Like it's, it's normal. You will come out of that, but uh, losing in grief and that can be very difficult. You know, I, I love the points that he brought up because you know what? Okay, I'm not going to feel like this anymore. I, I've seen and talked to people. I've got an action plan and I start to do that and I don't feel any better at the end of the day. And that was the dumbest thing that I've ever tried. That doctor was full of crap. And before you know it, I've got a whole another two weeks, a month, a year living in that grief stage, right? Where I'm excessively depressed. And I, I went through it. It was awful. And I think he brings up a really good point for anybody out there that's going through and, and, and is experiencing grief that it's really important that you understand you got to keep trying. Because the minute that you say this isn't going to work, the minute you give up on yourself, because that's really what you're doing. I gave up on myself that I could overcome this. And it caused it caused much more pain than it needed to. Well, I think it's really trying to bang the drum of how important patience is in a really results oriented world. And, and I think there's things that that threaten how critical patients are when we see 
people make snap judgments all the time. You know, I mean, I mean, you look at the, the NHL hockey coach, right. Is that inevitably if, if people have the patience to sort of allow a team to go through a storming, forming, norming and performing phase, chances are that the systems that are put in place, that the overall process will start bearing results when people are inundated with how intolerant most people are with the process. And it's like, Nope, sorry. I, you know, I gave this four games and, you know, and, and I, we're making it, you know, it, it re, I think it does a real disservice to how important patients really are and why, you know, the sports world and most of those guys know, I'm sure Willie knows better than, than lots of people that, you know, I'm choosing to be in a profession where patience just isn't, isn't appreciated probably to the level it needs to be for, for people to actually have the success they, they need to have in the long run. And it's funny because I asked him that I said, Willie, you know, patience is a big part. He's like, I got no patience. Right. It, it's unbelievable. Kate, you know, we talk about the burdens we carry. Yeah. And I think around the point that you guys were just talking about is that um, we have mentioned at the beginning of this is that it's a new way of life. It's a new way of moving forward with that loss that you are carrying and that, and that burden or that weight and whatever that looks like. And if you start to think about it and not to diminish the context of loss or grief, but if you, if you consider that if when my daughter was 11 months old and she stood up and I expected her to walk right away, what is the in-between of that developmental process of her learning a new way of life? of understanding the world in a different lens at a different viewpoint that she's now on her feet. So we can only have realistic expectations of ourselves as we move forward through this process. And we have to be kind to ourselves and we have to have patience, but it's not going to be a stand up and walk forward kind of process. It's going to be a stand up, applaud myself because I'm standing on my own two feet and if I need to sit back down again then that's okay because tomorrow I will get up and maybe bend my knees to take my first step that's okay yeah you know one of our teammates Derek Hines uh former marine he went and did some training and and you know what they told him was drop your pack and you know when we go through loss when we go through trauma when we go through life what happens is we stop and we pick up these boulders and, and we throw them in our backpack. And, you know, that visual that we gave you there, you know, these are the burdens that we carry. We don't have to carry them. And it was really interesting because when I asked Chris this question, I, I think you guys will enjoy his reaction. Oh, huh, that's a good question. I think I do. Yeah. I... It's funny that that's literally a metaphor, but I have a bag in my bedroom and it's Jackson's suitcase from Humble. I haven't looked in the bag. So when we went to Humble, we packed up his stuff, um, we packed up his suitcase and it's beside my bed for two years. Yeah. I haven't unzipped it. Taylor and I talked about it. Uh, do you want to go through Jackson's stuff? And we're like, well, what are we going to do with it? Like, I mean, the only one that can wear it is Brett. Um, but as far as the metaphorical bag that I'm dragging behind me, I, I think I look in once in a while. I never go in and try to clean it all. Yeah. But I might just kind of peek in the bag and say, oh, yeah, there's there's my stuff. I'm going to close up the bag and start dragging it again. I don't know. Um, I'm not afraid to go look in the bag. Yeah, I was afraid to look in the back. I mean, I was terrified to look in the back because, well, it just brought up all the stuff, right? It brought up the loss. It brought up the trauma. It brought up the insecurity. It brought up the self-doubt. It brought up, and, and then it was just easy to go dive into the bottle, right? I don't have to deal with any of this shit. I don't want to look at that stuff. But Kate, it's so important that we understand that we're going to have to at some point because the longer we carry that bag around, not only is it doing more damage to us, but it's also doing more damage to everybody around us. Absolutely. And I think when we look at it from that more of that neuroscientific physiological perspective, um, we have a choice every day to look at and figure out the areas that we want to strengthen within our, our 
brains, right? Um, if we wake up and we are strengthening the area of carrying that heavy bag, then we are creating new connections, new neuronal connections in our mind. And that is where we will sit for a lot longer. That bag will be harder and harder to unpack the longer that we sit there. Again, not saying that we need to be ready right away, but knowing at some point, and that can be what we move forward to. And that's where those small steps can be is trying to lighten that load. So that doesn't become our normal long term. Doing it all at once is completely unrealistic. And actually, you know what, it's probably going to cause more problems than it's going to solve, right? It's a step by step process, do a little bit at a time, right? It's no different than cleaning your house for spring cleaning. You're not doing it all in one day. You're going to go to work on the garage first, and then you're going to clean the windows, and then you're going to get the patio furniture up. It's no different with the with the loss and the grief that we experience, is if we can start to unpack that just a little bit by little bit, uh, we're going to benefit hugely. This next video with Willie Desjardins, I thought was really important. Sean, I'm going to come to you after this, because I think this is a lot of stuff. Well, here we go. Look at this. Do you still carry things in your pack from a loss that you have encountered? Sadie, go ahead and keep that up if you don't mind. Sean, when we talk about that, right? Um, how unhealthy is this? Well, I, I was, you know, to me, you're really encouraged to hear Chris talk about two years in that that's probably a place of acceptance that he's experienced. And acceptance doesn't mean that I'm happy, right? Acceptance means I'm, a, I'm accepting that life is pain, right? And, and the old, there's a really good saying by uh, Dr. Marshall Linehan that talks about the only way out of hell is is acceptance that hell exists right and and so it's it doesn't mean i'm excited about it it means i'm not allowing it to control me forever and the fact that that chris is talking about you know i'm not scared to look in the pack it doesn't mean i'm able i'm able to go in and pull all the all the stuff out but the fact that i'm not scared to look in the pack is probably a pretty good indication of of a of some level of acceptance around the tragedy and the trauma that has that has occurred with mm -hmm. the loss of the son, and and we know right because we know about the brain enough to know when we're in we're in the good part or we're in the not good part, right? When Chris is talking about that, he's in a good part. Yeah, you can tell, right? He's fully acknowledging that. Yeah, I can look in there. I'm not touching nothing, <laughs> but I can open it up and take a look. Well, that's a great start. You know, and, and every every day, you know, if that's one of your goals and, and we'll talk about it as we kind of wind up, but it, it's important because you look at here, you know, the people that are answering, do they still carry things around? Yeah, that, that slows you down, man. right? It, it, it makes you more skeptical. It makes you less trusting. It makes you less open. And, and I can tell you from building all these walls from all the different things that I've experienced, it, it really it, it takes the luster out of life. And yes, it sucks, but we don't have to live this way. We can drop our pack. We can go through our shit and, and we can own our shit and we can move on clear and, and in a much better direction. Well, sometimes I think it's the fear um, that we're not going to be able to get back or we're not going to be able to recover. I really like that slogan from AA um, that today is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday, right? That idea that our brain is always sort of worrying about mm -hmm. the future and in fact then today shows up and and many of us have found the strength skills and abilities to deal with today and whatever today was but um for many of us the sunday scaries right if we're talking about today being monday many people would have convinced themselves about how horrible monday was you know what i mean so that idea that you know today's the yeah. you know tomorrow i worried about yesterday yeah this part from willie was really good uh, and i think a lot of it relates to covid I'll go every year and when the year ends, at least 70% of the time I get sick at the end of the year. And it's because you're, you're driving your body so hard. And the minute you relax, the minute that whatever, then it just gets you. Like, you, like it, it's like you've been redlining and, <clears throat> and then you don't, then you, there's nothing, maybe it's because it's a change of pace or whatever. Lots of different things can come into it. You put all your energy into stuff. Like you never just, the loss very seldom just comes. Usually you're battling for a long time. Like in Vancouver, I was battling probably a year and a half over things. So all of a sudden, you're, you've used up all your reserves. All your reserves are gone. 
And then all of a sudden, then walks in the big battle. Like your big battle comes and you've been flat out for a year and a half. And you just, you know, if that big battle occurred a year and a half, no problem. But it's hard when the big battles occurred after you've put all your energy and everything you could into it. And that's when you need other people around you. You do. You just need good people. You, you need people around you. And I don't know. It's, uh, it, it's it, it, you know, and it's, I guess it's a belief. Like, you know, I guess for me, it was, I've always just been raised. Like, whatever happens, you just got to move on. But I don't think there's, um, you don't realize, you don't realize how much energy you've already expended before that big battle occurs. I, I think so much about that, right? Like when I went through the loss of my dad, it was 10 years that he was diabetic that we had to take him to dialysis. So it was every day fighting that battle. And then you see him sick and then you see him have to go to the doctor and there's more wrong, you know, for 10 years. And then all of a sudden that loss came and it, we were exhausted and it, and it crippled us, right? Because we, was, we were already so exhausted. And I mean, you think about these times of COVID and everything that's going on in this crazy world right now, um, people were redlined before. They were so busy. People you always used to tell me and they'd make that excuse. I don't have any time. Well, can you come and listen to us and we can teach it? No, we, can, we don't have any time. So redline, redline, redline. And then all of a sudden the world goes stop. And now everybody's crashing. And I think that's a lot of, you know, what we're experiencing with, with loss in, in our normal way of life. Listen, it ain't ever going to be that way. If you're, if you're hoping it's going to be like that, it ain't ever going to be like that. Kate, I, I know we talk, right? You, you've experienced some of this. It, it's not a fun thing to do. And, and, and it's so important that we're taking care of ourselves. A hundred percent. And, and knowing what that looks like for us too, right? Going back to, again, what we've talked about before, what, how do I know when I'm sh making that shift and how do I shift myself back? And I think that like Bob was just talking about sometimes where we're leading up to what pot potentially might be loss, um, that adrenaline can take over and we can grasp at things to take control. Uh, if our loved one is still here, we can try to, to grasp at all those pieces and have that control. But when they're gone, now we've lost that. Now what? Right. And, and so our system starts to react internally around, holy cow, I'm out of control. And now I don't have my dad, my brother, my whoever it is um, to, to get me back to where I need. And that relational regulation isn't there because it, we've lost that. Um, so lots of things going on. And, and yes, Bob, for sure. 100% I am a person that is go, 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 go. Um, I love to be busy. I, I love what I do. I'm passionate about what I do. Um, but sometimes I need that reminder. Sometimes it's from Bob. Sometimes it's from my husband. Sometimes it's from my mom. Hi, mom. Mm -hmm. um, that I just need to slow down. And having those people in my life that know me and know what that looks like for me is a helpful reminder so that I can make sure to catch it before I get there. Some of the most valuable things that we've learned there, Sadie, if you don't mind, just pull that up. Um, and we're going to talk about it here in a minute, Sean. This is our favorite topic to try, right? Mm -hmm. we, we talk about it all the time. But understanding what phase color you're occupying, right? Where am I at is, is huge because then you can do something about it. I understand you lost your best friend. You lost, you know what I mean, the dog that's been with you for four. I, I get it where are you at right now and what are you doing to help yourself mm -hmm. because the thing that i've learned in going through that i was not helping myself with the things that i was experiencing and it's so important you know getting creative scheduling your days right some of these things on the screen sean are, are critically important for us to be able to manage through the grief and the loss that we've experienced so that we don't get to that place where we believe i've got to do some sort of real drastic action because there's, there's just no way i can cope with what i'm facing is i think these are some of the the strategies that can maybe walk us back from feeling the need to take you know and and when i think about times when i've acted out in my life right whether i've acted out you know variety of high-risk behavior it's typically times where i've depleted 
my energy doing, you know, running at a pretty hot pace. So then I'm that much more vulnerable to do things, do a lot of self-medication, do things that feed the ego, do things that release some sort of temporary, you know, tension building. Um, and, and the times where I've done that are the times where I've probably been overstretching myself and disconnecting myself from the true things that align with my values and beliefs, then it's easier to act out. Yeah. This next video from Willie is really good um, because it's resilience, right? I survived. I don't know how I survived, but I survived. I, I survived this one and then I survived that one. And you know what? I survived that one. And holy shit, there's another one. I survived that one too. And then, oh my goodness, there's one more. And it was all because internally, after every loss and getting through it, I knew that I could do it again. Whatever life's been throwing at me, I know that I can overcome. It doesn't mean I'm going to like it. And, and what Willie has to say, I think, is, is really important for anybody out there that's going through it. You, you do. Like, you're, you're the one in the end that has to do it. <clears throat> and lots of times I, I just think I hung in there long enough till good things happen. And it's just hanging in there some days. Like, <clears throat> you know, you talk about batters go up to the plate and you're against a really good picture. And sometimes all you're doing is trying to fall balls off till you can get one you hit. Like, it's not like you're trying to hit the home run because today's not a home run day. Like, other days are home run days. You go up, things are rolling, you're hot, things are great. You can hit the home run. But there's days that you get to the plate that this guy's so good, you're just trying to hang in there till you find one you can hit. And I think that's, you know, when you get into tough situations, that's what you're doing. You're just staying at the plate till you find days when you can get some traction and get going again. And there's so much out there. There's so many, you know, you look at Abraham Lincoln's story, failed like 13 times before he finally succeeded. There's so many stories of people being so successful after tough situations. And we all have that. Like I talk about the mountain, like you're climbing the mountain and there's fog at the top and you're going, I'm climbing and climbing. I'm so tired and you quit. And all of a sudden you start down and, and you look up and you were one step away from the top. All you had to do is go one more day and she's downhill. One more. And that's what you got to know. You got to know that it's going to turn. And you just have to, you just have to hang in there and keep going. Kate, when I, when I think about that, it, it, it's such an interesting thing because we, we push, right? We want it so bad. We want to get there. We got to get there for everybody else. Oh my God, I got to get my, I got to get my life together. And, and we're not taking care of ourselves in those processes, right? Sleep, food, water, basic needs. We abandon them. Um, being able to find times to laugh and get with friends. We, we just got to get healed. And, and it makes the journey twice as long. And there's no chance for us to get to the top because we're exhausted halfway through. Like taking care of ourselves in every aspect of the trauma and loss and the grief is absolutely critical to getting to that life where there is that sense of normal. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, a nice way to think about it is what are the tools in your toolbox to get to that end goal, right? You may know where you want to go. You may know how you want to feel and what you want that to look like, but what are the tools that you're using to get there? And if they're not the right tools, it's going to be that much longer of a journey up that higher and higher mountain as you continue to look up and it seems like it continues to get higher. Mm -hmm. My buddy Krug's had some really good uh, advice to share. And I think, Sean, this plays right into what we've talked about for the last three years through Western Canada and all the communities is really is about our tribe. Find your support system. You know, find the people that, you know, you are comfortable around that, you know, um, it's gonna, it's gonna be by your side and, and, and help you through the moments. And, and, uh, you know, for me, that was important is to, to hang around with my friends and, to, um, making sure they got my back and, 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 you know, it was making sure that my mom, um, 
was feeling good enough to, to move on um, with what she had to deal with, what we had to deal with the family. But, um, you know, I think finding uh, and creating a, a support system um, and using that to your advantage for sure. Try it, right? The people around us. Um, there's always somebody. And, and, and I know that I, I felt like there was nobody. There was somebody, right? There's, there's always somebody, Sean. And lots of people that I think go through times where they're not at their best um, is often a really good place to evaluate tribe, right? Um, because everyone's really thrilled to show up when things are going well, right? And if maybe you have something that you can offer to them, if you're performing at a level that things are going well, I think it's always a good measurement to go, who's there when things aren't going well? Who's there when you've maybe done something just totally boneheaded, maybe something that's right outside of who you, who you want. You know, I, I think there's some defining times, you know, and I, um, you know, and I do sort of those therapeutic conversations with people, people that feel pretty lonely and isolated. Um, they, they usually can, they can find the people that have been there for them, uh, when they haven't been at their best, not just when there's been something to gain um, uh, around being their friend. Yep. Yeah. Particularly with people with wealth, right? I think people with wealth necessarily need to evaluate, you know, who, who are the people that, you know, and you, you see that play out with lots of sports athletes and stuff that, oh, all of a sudden this tribe of people don't seem to be as readily available when they're not just running off my expense account and those sorts of things, you know, like I think there's, there's good ways to evaluate yep tribe versus versus just posers yep. yeah go ahead Kate. yeah and i think to follow up on that is is what are you looking from for from your tribe what do you need from those people in your life that um you know they may be family but it doesn't mean that just because they're family they can offer you what you need um likely a non-judgmental space to to be not okay right that conversation about it's okay not what is it? It's okay to be not okay. Um, and I need to know for me that I can be where I'm at and say it with honesty and know that red flags won't be lifted just because I may have had a breakdown or whatever that looks like, right? So figure out what that looks like for you and seek those people out because they've got you. Yeah. It, we are so resilient. You, you think about all that you've been through in your life from the time that you were a little infant, right? I mean, just coming into this world, you want to talk about traumatic, right? That's why we're screaming when we come into the world and, and all these things happen to us. And, and we just, we we're way more resilient than we give ourselves credit for. And yes, sometimes life takes us out, you know, at the knees, but we get back up. That's what we do. And we do it for ourselves. And then we do it for the people around us. Like there's always, there's always motivation out there, right? I don't want to feel like this anymore. That's all the motivation you need. If you want to do it for somebody else, okay, great. But find it, right? Because we do have that ability. Resilience is distinct from mere survival. And more than mere endurance, resilience is often endurance with direction. And, and Sean, we go back to what we have learned about um, you know, loss and grief and, and some of the things that we know, tribe is critical, right? Understanding the phase and, and where we're at mentally in our brains. Um, talk about scheduling your days and, and what value that is to somebody that might be struggling on a day-to-day -day basis. Scheduling our days in a way that highlights the different things our brains need, right? That I think we're really good at scheduling meetings and we're really good at scheduling um, things that, that are essential for probably employment. Did we schedule a time to have a meaningful conversation with someone we care about? Did we schedule some time to get outside and breathe the fresh air? Did we schedule some time to maybe try to breathe mindfully for a few minutes? I, I really think we need to make our schedules a little more sophisticated because that to me is a more performance-based schedule. The ones where it's just running from meeting to meeting, I, I, there's survival schedules and there's schedules that I think deplete our willpower as well. They deplete us from being able to manage one more thing that comes our way if we're not structuring in things that, that help us perform at a high level too. When is it time to be sad, right? I got to hold it together today. I can't be sad today. I got to function, right? I, I got lots of people that are depending on me to, to have it together. 
So I'm going to be together. But come four o'clock, I can go into my room and I can cry for an hour. I can feel bad, right? I can, I can go to the gym. I can go to the gun range and shoot stuff, right? But those meaningful pieces of schedule are just critical for us to be able to feel good. Absolutely. And I think I'll just jump in there to say that, um, you know, especially when we're experiencing grief, if crying or emotional outlet in some way is what our system needs, and we deprive it of that, even if it means getting through the day, our mind, if we've scheduled that time for ourselves at the end of the day is allowed to release it a little bit, it doesn't go anywhere, but it doesn't take as much mental energy to get through the day when I know I'm going to have that time for that release. Um, and so absolutely, Absolutely. Fitting in time with your kids, your animals, whatever that looks like for you, journaling, getting things out of your head onto paper. Um, those strategies for you are those tools in your toolbox to make sure that you're climbing that smaller mountain right. in front of you. Sadie, go ahead and pull up the last question that we have for everybody while we give some thanks here. You know, I'd really like to thank the, the Niwa family. They've been so good. Um, to be able to bring this forward and, and to support the community and really want to make a difference out there. Uh, you know, Medicine Hat College, Jen and her team there, uh, absolutely fantastic. The Medicine Hat Public School District, Prairie Rose, the Catholic Board of Education and uh, Chief Mike Warden there with the police. And I'd like to thank my team, you know, Kate, Sean, Sadie, Ray, Esty, uh, all the facilitators who have been a part of the facilitate, uh, the group sessions that we did last week was phenomenal. Um, we want to touch on that just for a little bit here. Um, people that might be looking for a little bit more. Tomorrow night, 7 p.m., you can register on the same website you registered for this. Sean, talk about your experience last week in, in our group session where we discussed trauma a little bit more. I think the most helpful part of doing something didactic, meaning this, like we're talking at people for an hour or an hour and a bit, is that it's it's based on your experience and your training, but you don't get a ton of feedback. I mean, seeing people, you know, talk about whether the session was helpful or not, I think is really good at the end. What I liked about last Tuesday is an opportunity to open it up and get that live time feedback and discussion, uh, you know, and, and connect with people that that are all here um, for, for a shared idea. And they don't necessarily know what that is, but something's driven them here to go I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a risk I'm gonna have this conversation I'm gonna share my perspective for me it was really really great because to just do the kind of one-dimensional didactic um, you know it, it's nice to get get that conversation going and more directly with people and more back and forth serve and return is is a really good good experience but Kate my, my heart was full but my heart was sore you know it, it, it was I felt great being able to have all those stories shared. Um, so it emotionally was completely filled up. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was sad too. Right. But totally. Okay. Not in a way that I didn't want to go. It's just like, what an unbelievable experience to have. How was it for you? Yeah, I would mimic what you guys have said just around even just to be part of something like that and create that comfort for other people and to learn from each other, right? And that was the biggest piece for me is um, in those moments, hearing everybody's stories that definitely situationally were very, very different, but they were able to come together and provide different suggestions and strategies and metaphors around what that journey has looked like for them. And that's where that hope comes in, right? Um, if the, if it gives us that little bit of hope, then, then it's a good night. And yeah. it gave me that for sure. So tomorrow night, seven o'clock, um, talking a little bit more about loss and grief, having our breakout rooms. Sadie, is there any questions that anybody has for us? I see there's a couple of things lit up there. Okay. Uh, what do you do if you're at work and you can't wait until the end of the day to cry or address emotions that you are experiencing? Kate, got any ideas? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, so when we have an emotional need, some, something like we we're, we're need to let that out um, and release that piece to, to be able to hold it together, if that's not reasonable for us, we either need to let it out and figure out what that looks like for us or replace it with something else that might be more what we would term functional at the workplace. It could be something that we do before we go to work. If I'm finding that I'm not making it through the day, then I need to start my day differently um, so that that 
need might not be as strong for me and I might be able to get to the end of the day or maybe not I can just replace that with something else and you know I think one habit that we really get into when we're going through all of the the busyness of our days is that we we put it off and then we do say well there's something wrong with me I can't even make it through a day this is part of your process and that's okay but figuring out functionally what that looks like for you is part of your specific journey yeah something beforehand for sure is, is, is so important but also um you feel it come right it never catches you off guard you feel it and 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 the, the more powerful it gets it's that wave right the first little one it's kind of like oh geez what was that and then there's another second one you're kind of like oh, oh okay i better take, take this and 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 so you do something before it gets to be that problem sean do you have any um ideas that you can share with uh just just that that idea that if we find a place or people at work or at school that we can talk things out we're less likely to act them out you know and and i think someone that needs to take a minute and express some emotion and actually cry or or kind of deal with the intensity of a moment is probably a much more adaptive way than someone that holds it in until they snap and maybe start you know engaging in some sort of anger based you know outburst yeah. so i you know i think there's yeah Great talk you two. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. And I hope you guys got something out of it too. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Always do. Yeah. Always right? do. Yeah. So we got some chats going on there. If anybody has any other questions. Um, yeah. And you know what? If if uh you'd like to participate more, if there's other topics you're interested in, um I don't know if she's on the call or not. Um, but I think it would be really cool for them to reach out to Janet at the Medicine Hat College. Um, they've been putting out all the social media posts. If there's something else that you'd like to learn about, um, I know we're having discussions about what else we can do to support the community. So if there's anything that's on your mind or something that you would like to learn about in this format, um, please reach out to Jen at uh, Medicine Act College. You can probably catch her through the um, social media through the Medicine Act College. Any other question? How does cumulative grief affect your ability to cope? Yeah, Sean, that's a good one. Well, cumulative, yeah, cumulative stress or, yeah, like it, I, I think the idea is, is that there, it may need to be a dynamic response. So there might be multiple tools and strategies that we have to use where, because it's sort of not just an isolated, or if we think back to last week, not an isolated traumatic event where everything of the difficulty I'm dealing with, I can relate to one instance and instead it's it's multiple things. And so, and, and I, for me, I like to always try to assess what are the scorpions that are closest to my feet. Right. And so not realistic to think that I can address everything at once. And maybe what are the scorpions that I need to kind of deal with first? Cause they're the ones that are presenting the most danger to me right now. And those other ones, although I, I am going to need to deal with those, maybe they can bubble on the yeah. stove a little bit longer than these ones that are right about to nibble on my toes kind yeah. of thing. So I, yeah. Always ask that question. Okay. Which one's causing you the most pain? Yeah. This one. Okay. Yeah. Let's start to work on that. One. Yeah. But yeah. what about these other? No, we can't do anything until we address that. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think that's where a lot of people Kate, could really struggle is that they try and do all of it. Mm -hmm. And that's like Willie was saying is, you know, you start and you have a day where none of it works. So you quit. Well, a lot of times, because we overwhelm ourselves by trying to do all of it. Yeah, it's those small steps, right? And knowing in what direction we're we're moving towards, but then being patient and being kind to ourselves when we may take one step forward and 17 steps backwards, that's okay. We're still going to get up the next day and try again. That trial and error is so important along with that patience around what that process can look for like for you. Yeah. And I think to go back to that workplace one, it, it's really interesting because hopefully we're getting to a place in the 21st century where there's going to be, uh, hopefully we can create these environments because they're still out there where it's not, where I feel safe enough that I can go and have that conversation, right? And not worry about the stigma, not worry about if I go to HR and say that, you know what, I'm really dealing with something that all of a sudden they're going to take out a pen and paper and start making notes. And now I'm crapping my pants thinking, did I say too much? You know, and, and so erasing that stigma of a, a mental illness and you know that we're all going through stuff is just so important to ingrain in the cultures and when we get a chance to select who we want who our tribe is like you said sean you have to be able to and kate you said it too right it's what do you want from them those are the people that you pick 
And sometimes I think you don't know what you want until you've either experienced <laughs> what you don't have, or you've experienced something that you know for sure you don't want. And that's that's been part of my journey for sure, um, is people around in the darkest, deepest moments of my life um, sometimes hasn't been exactly what I've needed. And now I know that. <laughs> yeah, if we want a culture of whatever you want, culture of happiness, culture of performance, it has to start with a culture of safety. Um, you know, if, if, a, if a space isn't safe, it's really hard, um, like Maslow would say, it's pretty hard to self-actualize if you're starving, right? And so it really is sequential in terms of how you go about and, and creating a safe workplace is, um, is, is of critical importance. Yeah. There's a question there. How can, we, how can we be supportive for people who need someone when they have a moment like this, whether we are their partner or even just as a coworker. Okay, so we see the emotional, right? It's not us, but we see it in somebody else. What do we do? We immediately remind ourselves that we don't have to solve the problem for the other person, right? Which is sadly the first thing that I, <laughs> oh my God, this person I care about is in distress. How do I solve their distress? Really unrealistic. You know, I think it's, it's about, um, yeah, I will be here, I'll be present, I'll be attuned, I'll be attentive, I'll try to be responsive, but but I'll ultimately just try to listen, you know, because um, if I jump into problem solving before I even understand what it is you're dealing with, I'm likely to screw it up and maybe even come across as insincere or um, unhelpful. And then, and then it maybe creates more of a roadblock for that person ever wanting to you know, um, open up again, because we, we jumped in too soon to try to problem solve instead of just listen. And, and we talk about the three R's, right? First one is regulate. So if I see someone in distress, the first thing I'm going to do, because I know now is to try and help them regulate themselves. So, Hey, you know, I can see you're upset. Let's go for a little walk. How does that sound? Or let, let's go for, I got to go to the store and get something to eat. Come with me, mm -hmm. right? Something to get them out so that they can, they can do something to snap themselves out of it. Because Kate, you can't force somebody out of that state. They have to do it themselves. Absolutely. It's their own process, right? And when, if we start to look at the brain, they've shifted that downward place. And that's what Bob's referring to is around that regulation piece is starting to get them up to more of that relational and reasoning where, again, they might be able to express what's bothering them or what's maybe triggered that and maybe not. And that's okay. Um, but I think 100% what Sean said, not having those answers, but being able to create that space um, is so important when we see people going through an experience like that um, and also reminding ourselves that we are not there to join the chaos of what might be happening for that individual um, our job is to remain regulated so that we can support excellent Rhonda I love your comment there I refuse to hide my grief we've done this way too long and this is why people don't get to learn grief is a natural part of the process of being humans Sean you say it all the time Human beings having a human experience. Yeah, you bet. They got to put in the manual the grease part of it, though, don't you? Think? Yeah. <laughs> well, and for us to be the change we want to see, yeah. too, right? Like that idea that, you know, if I do want to make it okay, then, you know, for me, that's accountability for me. And I've had to do lots of reflection on that. Like as a leader in some of the, you know, the jobs that I have, it's like, have I made it okay? Or have I, you know, maybe almost indirectly or subtly been like, you know, I know we talk lots about this, but, you know, don't kid yourself. It's actually not okay. You just need to get your shit together now. And so I think we, uh, we've been conditioned for a long, long time to, um, to sort of, you know, just tough, stiff upper lip and, and, you know, move, you know, so we got to always think, hold ourselves accountable and reflect on how, how we're doing to, to, to make that safe space where people can show and feel the emotions they need to. Yeah. And, and within boundaries in the right place, like there's certain things that we do have to be aware of, right? We can't be walking around as an emotional wreck all the time because that just makes everybody nervous. Um, that adds to the frustration. I mean, a lot of people are uncertain, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people when they see someone crying, they don't know what the hell to do mm -hmm. because there's no training. There's no, and, and so you're going to get a couple of different reactions. Suck it up. Why are you crying? Right. All those different things. And, you know, there's comments about the workplaces. I mean, workplaces can be the worst place just because of all the conditioning in one place. And we're all different goals, values and beliefs. Right. Mm -hmm. Kate, toughen up. 
what's your problem right that can be that can be a, that and that's just my conditioning because that's what my parents every time i got sad that's what they said to me yeah so now i say that to everybody else so we talk about a systemic problem yeah we absolutely have one mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think having that awareness and that rec recognition again of what we need to do for ourselves, um, recognizing, like Bob said, what those triggers are for us as we start to feel, generally, we don't want to go there, so we avoid it at all cost and stay away from those places. Um, but like it was alluded to in the comments is that um, it's a journey through that process. And when we allow ourselves to do that, then we can start to problem solve and recognize what that looks like for us. Yeah. Great comments. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, we'll hang around for a couple more minutes. Sean just had an emergency call that he had to take. So um, he's out. Thank you so much for allowing us into your community and spending time with us. We really appreciate it. And Kate, always have a, a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. And I think um, for tonight, just be kind to yourself, have patience with mm -hmm. yourself and smile. <laughs>